In the last video we studied how to play the King's Indian type 3 pawn structure with white. Now we will continue on by seeing some examples of how black could approach this type of play. So this game started with d4, knight f6, c4, g6, okay, all the usual moves. And now white somewhat deviated from the usual by playing bishop g5. Here maybe queen c2 would have been quite similar, in fact very similar to games that we studied in the previous video. So here bishop g5. And now the game continued with h6, take, take, b4, and knight d7. Now, we could say black has gained a pair of bishops in exchange for two tempos, because he played knight c5, and then after b4 he had to go back. Now, on the other hand, we could say, well, the knights are better than the bishops in close positions, so it's kind of hard to evaluate this situation. In reality, both statements are irrelevant. What truly matters here is that white has given up his dark squared bishop, which emphasizes black's natural control of dark squares. Which, I mean, this typically happens in uh, King's Indian pawn structures because of the pawns on uh, d6 and e5 anyway. So you see the squares like d4 and f4 are already a little bit under control. Now that the dark squared bishop is gone, this control is accentuated. So now this concession that white has made will be felt later in the game. And uh, we will see that having two extra temples actually is not going to count for that much. Now the game continues with knight e1. I would say this is not a particularly good square. Well, the knight might be coming to d3, which kind of makes sense. And then the idea would be to play c4, but this is not going to be strong enough. And then in the meantime, white will become kind of vulnerable because, you know, black is going to play f5 very soon. Now, another option might have been knight d2, but then queen e7, knight d3, you know, c4 is not particularly strong yet, and then maybe f5 is an option. Then rook c1, knight f6, you know, this is a balanced game. And another option might be h5, and then maybe rook c1, bishop h6, attacking the rook, then rook c2, knight f6, and then h4. It's another option with an interesting game. And you know, maybe h3 will be possible in the future, then maybe the knight will rearrange, and then f5 will come anyway. Notice that in this particular position, you know, this idea of taking a knight b5 actually doesn't seem too scary. Maybe because, for example, white doesn't have a bishop on this long diagonal from g1 to a7, so the a7 pawn is not as weak as it typically tends to be. So let's go back. In the game, white played knight e1. Then queen e7, f5, knight f6. You see, this pawn on e4 is already under some pressure. And now white played bishop f3. Now the bishop is really not well placed here. But the alternatives were not actually that good either. So for example, if white had tried to hold the center by playing f3 instead, the absence of his dark squared bishop is felt really badly after h5. This move allows the bishop to come into play. And now the game could continue with maybe c5, bishop h6, check on e3, take, take, and now a6. So this is where, okay, we are taking a small pause, we are covering the b5 square, and then after rook f3, bishop d4, white cannot play knight b5 and knight takes d4, that's kind of the point of playing a6. And black has a clear advantage here, I mean, he has excellent peace coordination, he can play in the king side, he can control game in the queen side, you know, this bishop has a wonderful diagonal, and then maybe bishop g4 or knight g4 will be coming soon. Meanwhile, it's worth noticing that white's queen side play isn't really going anywhere. There are no entry points. There's nothing to pursue. So let's go back a few moves. Instead of f3, so we just said bishop f3 was not great, f3 is not great. What about pawn takes? So pawn takes, bishop takes. It's hard to come up with uh, useful moves for white. You know, the standard plan would be to fight for the e4 square, but now maybe we can play f3, you know, and the goal is to play knight f2 and bishop d3. I mean, if white can do those moves and then put a knight on e4, he will be doing pretty well. The problem is here, I can just play e4 with black. Pawn take, knight takes, knight takes, queen takes. And here white is just awfully overextended. He doesn't quite have enough pieces to protect all the holes, like the d4 and the e3 square, and then the pawn on c4 is kind of vulnerable. He's just kind of one mistake away from losing some material. Going back a little bit, instead of f3, maybe white could just play something different, like queen d2. But here, black can just make slow progress with, say, king h7, and then the idea is to play h5 and bishop h6 to put some pressure along that diagonal. You know, things get ugly for white. So going back a little bit, in the game, white played bishop f3. Not ideal, but apparently there, there wasn't 
much to do instead of that. So now black played h5. Nice move. Gains some additional space to the king side and also allows the bishop to participate from h6. The game continued with rook e1, providing some support to the pawn on e4, now bishop h6 and queen h7. This is a nice move, it kind of puts some pressure along this diagonal, which will be felt later in the game. And now maybe white should have played c5, but after g5, good move, white cannot take on h5 because of g4 and the bishop will be trapped on h5, but instead maybe g3, g4, then take, take, and bishop f5. And you know this pressure in the diagonal is felt, black is a little bit better here. So let's go back a few moves. Here, after queen h7, white played queen e2, more support for a4, and now black played a5. This is a very nice move, very well timed. And uh, so what's the point of this move? Typically, people say that we are supposed to avoid contact in the side where we are being attacked. So here, black is being attacked on the queen side. So why do we play a5? So the point is that with a5, we are provoking white to damage his pawn structure. So for example, if he plays b5, then we play b6. Queen side plays dead. And then black would have three hands to play on the king side. Now the question is, what happens if white just wants to keep the queen side alive with a3? That's the question. Now the problem is that black could actually combine his strong king side play with an invasion along the a file. So for example, we play g5. Very nice move. And here are two options. For example, white might play g3, then he has to worry about g4 and f4, which looks very scary because of the threat of playing f3. Now, white could play f3, but then there is too much contact on the king side, and that kind of puts the king on g1 in very unsafe territory. So going back a few moves, after g5, maybe white's only real option is to take, and then we take with the bishop naturally. Again, you see putting pressure on this diagonal, now the knight is hanging, and maybe white will play knight e4. So now we continue on the queen side. We have put some pressure on the king side, now we go back to the queen side. So we take, take, and rook a3. And now black is threatening to trade everything on e4 and then capture the knight. Therefore, white's only chance is to play knight c1. So for example, something else. Say that white decided to play knight b2, then he's just losing because of g4. And the bishop is trapped. I mean, the only option to escape is take, take, and bishop e4, but then this is the issue. We take, 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 trade everything, and then rook a1, mate. Well, mating in two moves. So going back a little bit, we said that the only way for white to escape here is knight c1, which kind of blocks this rank. But then black can play king g7. This is a funny move. So you see, the point is that the direct move g4 actually allows white to survive. For example, take on f6 and bishop e4. This is the only thing then black is a lot better, but you know, nothing is falling yet. The key was that knight takes f6 was check. So then we can make this funny preparation move king g7. Now knight f6 is not check anymore. So now we are threatening to play g4. Well, black is putting a lot of pressure and the only way for white to play is knight takes f6. And now we can take king takes f6. So now the rook on c2 is under attack and we are playing g4 as well. So two problems. So white must play bishop e4, but then we trade everything and we play g4. And now black has a huge advantage. So what's the difference with previous variations? I mean, we traded a bunch of things, but now the king is coming to f5. There is a lot of pressure. You see, so the king is very good. Just if we compare the kings, we can see the advantage for black. But then also the bishop is very strong and the bishop and the knight on c1 is not particularly useful. Going back a few moves. Okay, so we kind of see what was the point of playing a5. Now, what if white decided to play b takes a5 instead, then rook takes, and then c5. So the c4, c5 break is achieved, but nothing much is accomplished. The d6 pawn isn't weak at all, and that's the point. So now black can just continue with g5, pawn take, bishop take. Okay, what about knight take? Black is winning a piece immediately, with a very funny move, rook a4. So we're just attacking the knight, and when you take and take, black has two major threats, take on d3 and play g4. So either the knight or the bishop is lost. Nothing to do. Going back then. After bishop takes, white is forced to play bishop e4. We can see that, you know, white is already finding only moves to survive. And now black can just play knight takes on e4, knight takes, rook a4, f3, and g4. 
And white is under serious pressure here. You know, we are combining the pressure on the diagonal with the pressure along the line with the pawn. Very nice position. So let's go back several moves. I mean, white probably saw all of these variations, didn't like them, and decided to play b5, which solves the problem for now. But white now accepts he will never be able to attack on the queen side again, which gives black free hands to attack on the king side. So obviously now black played b6 to stop the c4, c5 break almost permanently. So now maybe a4, bishop d7. Here white played knight b2. Let's make some comment about other possibilities. So for example, if white attempted to claim some space on the king side, I mean, he already kind of lost the battle on the queen side, so how about we play h4 to do something? Then black would just respond with f4. Nobody likes to have pawns separated, right? So we have this h4 pawn that is separated from the chain, could get attacked, so maybe g3 is kind of necessary sooner or later. And then at first, you know, space seems to be perfectly balanced on the king side, and one might think that white will manage to survive. But in reality, his position is near desperate because his pieces lack coordination. That's the kind of surprising thing. I mean, here black can just build pressure, so rook and rook. And unfortunately for white, you know, this bishop on h6 takes away some really important squares. I mean, notice that the rook is in a very funny spot on c2 and cannot go back to c1 to support the other rook, which makes things impossible for white. So now maybe the game might continue with knight d1, g5. So we just open up the game, white isn't ready. So take, take. Then, well, I mean, rook f2 to do something, I mean. And then knight g4. Take, take, take. And now we can just take on d1 and take on e4. And uh, white is going to lose a lot more material very soon. I would definitely recommend to analyze this position from here after rook f7 and rook f8. It looks like white might be okay, but he really is not. This is already a lost position. So let's go back several moves. As we said, h4 is not very good. So then white played knight b2. And you know, this move looks funny, but it's actually not entirely pointless. I mean, this move actually does have some serious plans. The idea is that now white can probably play c5. So what's the point of playing c5? The point of playing c5 is that then the c4 square will be cleared and then when you play c5, either black takes with the b or the d pawn, either way, either the a5 or the e5 pawn will become weak. So, not a pointless idea. So now, let's see, for example, if black had played rook f7, then white could create this and counterplay, c5. Well, let's stay with the b pawn to keep the e5 pawn well supported. And this is something that I really want you to remember. The e5 pawn is just so important. When you're playing King's Indian, you lose the e5 pawn, a lot of things are going to go wrong. Kind of as a rule of thumb, if you lose the e5 pawn, I don't think your attack will be successful. So, okay, you are maybe willing to lose the a5 pawn. So then knight c4, but notice the threat is nice. So for example, bishop f8, I mean, because, because I mean, white wants to play b6. If we play b6 and we end up winning the d6 pawn, we are one step away from winning the e5 pawn, and that's not good. So then after bishop f8, rook b2, and white has counterplay. Because I mean, now he's playing b6, and then the rook is coming, and then pressure on d6 gets ugly. So let's go back several moves. So here black played a nice move. He played f4. And now black is completely ready for this advance. Now the pawn avalanche with g6 and g5 is coming up. And uh, here white decided to play queen d3, which clears escape route for the bishop because the bishop was about to get trapped. Now what if he had tried to play c5 instead? So maybe pawn take, knight c4, black can play g5 with great chances. And now the game could have continued with queen d3, g4, bishop d1, queen e7. And again, great attacking chances. I mean, nothing to be afraid of in the queen side because we are already too advanced on the king side. So let's go back several moves. Now here, white played queen d3, g5, g4. And now the potential sacrifice with f3 is everything that should be on everyone's mind, right? White is pretty much forced to play f3, but now the game is strategically won for black because it has achieved the desired break in optimal conditions, while black has nothing on the queen side yet. Now black simply regroups his pieces to achieve the final assault. So queen e7, king, okay, clearing the space for the knight. Now here white could just wait, maybe play knight d3, rook g8, king h1, and then after queen g5, uh, we are capturing on f3. 
which is a very real threat. Since white can't retake the pawn, and uh, after queen e2, well, I can just take, take. You see, white couldn't take with the g pawn. So then black is now ready to break. I mean, there are many ways, but this is one. For example, knight f6, queen h4. Okay, we are basically bringing the rook, which decides the game. So knight e2 is forced, knight g4, knight comes to e3. Okay, so here white came up with a last minute resource. Let's trade queens to neutralize things. But it's funny that the attack just continues. We just play rook f8, and now the threat is f3 anyway. And this variation is very beautiful because now, well, maybe the knight has to go to g1. It's kind of the only move. Then rook comes to g3, knight f3, we double. And now knight h4. So instructive position. I mean, white has spent over 10 consecutive moves simply responding to whatever black's threats were. But now, I mean, at some point it's just impossible to respond because we can play, for example, here f3. So if you take with the pawn, check and mate. Very nice. Otherwise you take with the knight, but then knight takes f1. We win an exchange. And uh, now we win the game. Yeah, so it's, it's a very instructive win for black. Now, let's go back several moves because this is not what happened in the game. I mean, this is what would have happened if white had decided to go for some kind of waiting type defense, so like trying to hold the position. Instead, he tried to escape. So king f2, now queen h4. Obviously, I mean, you're not going to go back because after rook g8, black is just easily winning. So instead, king e2, queen takes. King d3, okay, hoping to escape, but now knight g5. And, you know, the king has escaped, but the attack just continues. We still have a very strong foundation for this attack. Remember, this is basically a pawn chain. We are attacking the base of the chain, the f3 pawn. And this is just very hard to survive. And here the game ended after rook e2, queen g1. We are coming to d4 with a mate. And then g3. So here white resigned because when he removes the rook, he'll get checkmated. Or if he went to d2, he will get checkmated in e3. So overall, this is a very nice win for black. Seems very convincing. And it all comes down to, you know, early in the game. I mean, maybe white just made kind of an unfortunate opening decision. Which, I mean, is okay, but the point here is that after he gave up his dark square bishop, I mean, the play just became very easy for black, and all of black's plans just worked very well. I hope you will keep this game in mind when you play your own games in this variation, or in this pawn structure. Now, let's see another example. So far, we have seen one of the most standard plans, which is to play f5, f4, g5, g4. Here we will see a different idea. The beginning was the usual. Now the game gets interesting around here, so in a previous video we saw a game where black ended up playing knight h6, knight f7, and then ended up playing h5 and c5. Okay, that was one possibility. Here we play h5 right away, and then the key moment is here. So far, normal position. Black here attempted an interesting idea, which is to play g5 and g4 right away. This creates immediate contact with white's skin side. The point is that a line will be opened, and then we will play f5 in a slightly different situation, which I'll explain later. So here, I mean, white could have tried to keep the h file close with h4, but then after f5, he would have been in serious trouble. I mean, the threat f4 practically forces him to take on e5, but then knight takes f5, and now the h4 pawn is lost. So this is not acceptable. Going back a couple moves, a serious option for white, though, would have been to play bishop h4. Since white is doing well, I mean, here, for example, if I take on h three and you take on h5, I could play queen d7, rook e1, pawn, and rook. And uh, white is doing pretty decent here. I mean, there is nothing for the queen to do on h3, so we will maybe put a rook on g3 and have some play with white. Another option is to take on g2. We take with the king, queen d7, and rook h1. And uh, here white's prospects are superior. I mean, there's better peace coordination. And uh, actually, he has good chances on the king side. I mean, this might be surprising. I mean, typically black gets good play on the king side. But, I mean, in this position, there is really no reason for that to be true. Actually, white is a lot better. For example, the game might continue with f5. I can trade and rook e2, and then I'll just bring my rook. Play rook g1, rearrange my king, and I'll start attacking on these files. So if I was black, I would be very scared in this position. Now, let's go back, though. I mean, because the point, though, is 
after this here, uh, black can just hold the tension, and that's kind of the important thing. I mean, he can just play queen e8, and then maybe play queen g6, and then f5. So there is no reason to panic. Black's position is pretty decent. So going back, after g4, white took, and took. And uh, here, I mean, it would have been quite reasonable to play bishop h4. And here, maybe one critical variation is bishop d7, f3. With white, we kind of open up before black has the chance to maybe rearrange the queen and play f5. So now maybe the game might continue with pawn take, uh, bishop take, queen c8. You know, we're getting out of the diagonal to play f5. And now white has a nice move, bishop h5. It's actually hard for black to play here because if we push, then bishop e7 wins an exchange. I mean, the rook is trapped. So instead of that, maybe black could play bishop g4, but then after some pieces are traded, White is doing a little bit better here. I mean, black could play king h7 to play f5 in the future, but you know, light squares are in white's control, which is not very nice for black. So going back a little bit, that would have been another decent chance for white, bishop h4. Instead, he played b4, which is very hard to understand, to be honest, because after we trade this and knight b3 and knight d4, black is doing quite well. I hope when you look at this, you remember that, you know, white does want to play c5, but you know, if a knight is going to end up on d4, if the rooks are going to be traded, if the pawns are going to be traded, then c5 is really not that strong. Especially notice, for example, the bishop on g3, I mean, what does it do? How are white's pieces ready to attack on d6? It's not very clear. Actually, this has gone very well for black, because after rook e1 and f5, you know, the position kind of transforms in a way that is not nice for white. So let's see the position after pawn takes and bishop takes. The pawn structure has changed. And in my book, I refer to this pawn structure as transformation B in the King's Indian type 3. Transformation A occurs when black takes on f5 with the pawn, and that gives rise to a different type of position. Here, what we have is a fight for the e4 square, right? If White could somehow establish a knight on e4, that could be very nice for him. It would kind of neutralize kingside play and support c5. But that's not going to be possible here. And that's one of the main things about black's strategy. You see he played g5 and g4. This pawn on g4 is just so helpful because now white cannot play f3. And that is the main problem for white. So, for example, now the game continued with uh, bishop f1, queen g5. And now this is very strong, nearly winning. Because black is now playing queen h5, knight, knight, and then rook. Okay, that plan actually requires six moves. That's a lot. But there are many small factors that make it possible. I mean, for example, notice the king on g1, I mean, it's basically trapped. The bishop on f1 makes things even worse, right? Because it takes some moves to take the bishop out and then some moves to get the king running outside of that cage. Even if the king were to get to a2, I mean, there's still a knight on d4 covering that square. The c5 break is not particularly helpful. And then you see, maybe with white, I mean, we might hope to play knight e4. I mean, that typically is the way to neutralize play. But here, after queen g6, there is no way to hold the knight on e4, right? The knight have to go away. Typically, white would support the knight by playing f3. Here, this loses immediately, obviously, after pawn take, take, take. And then the bishop on g3 is hanging. It's a very unfortunate situation for white. So instead, white decided to play c5. Here, I mean, black could have just played queen h5, which would have been very nice. Let's see some variations here. The game was similar, but let's see some variations after queen h5. The game could have continued with trading on b6, knight e2, take. And maybe now the best try could be bishop takes. If you played queen takes, maybe I would just play bishop g6, and then I might follow with knight f5, knight d4, or knight takes and e4 and bishop d4. There are so many ugly threats. So instead, bishop takes, knight f7, knight g5, and now rook f6. Now the threat, rook h6 is coming, and uh, the only option for white is to play f3. But after queen h7, black is playing bishop c2 with a, a very serious threat, and the threat is to actually win the f3 pawn at the end of the variation, right? Because we play bishop c2 and then we take on f3. But just to illustrate how vulnerable white's position is, for example, I mean, you can notice here that if you take on g4, then I can just play knight h3 right away. You can't move the king. I mean, if you move the king to h2, you lose the queen. If you move it to f1, you lose the queen anyway. 
So you must accept the sacrifice. But then after queen takes, we are attacking the bishop and uh, queen b3, bishop b4 is an unavoidable checkmate. There is really not a lot that white can do here to survive. So going back a few moves, after queen h7, white could play knight e3, bishop d7, and rook h6. And uh, white is actually on the verge of losing here. So going back several moves, the actual game here continued with knight of 7. Similar ideas. So take, take. If you had taken with the bishop here, then it would have been queen h5, transposing to the previous variation. So now here, black played queen h5. Now, if white, for example, tried to play queen e3 to create some quick counterplay by attacking that pawn, we just ignore it, right? Knight g5, rook f6. Rook h6 is coming, and the checkmate is coming after that. White could try to survive by playing f4, but then pawn take knight f2. Okay, we are covering the h1 square, very primitive way to survive. But now black can just play rook g6. And you know, white doesn't have any useful moves, anything to attack, so he can just wait to be defeated. For example, maybe rook e3, e4, queen d8, bishop f8, queen e8, I mean, just to do something. Now pawn take. We are ready to break now. If you take on f3, then I'll take on g3, check, and I will win your queen. So instead you play king f1, check, king e1, trying to escape, queen g6. The game is over. The point is that we are attacking the rook, but I mean, Taking just loses with rook takes g3. So going back several moves, the game here actually continued with rook c1, hoping to bring the rook and do something. Then knight g5, queen b1, rook f6, knight e4. Okay, this is already kind of the sign that the game is going to end because now we're going to take on g3 and then h2 and this diagonal become defenseless. So the game continued with bishop. Take, take, and bishop h6, and now white resigned. Now let's see the reason. I mean, after bishop h6, we're basically coming to e3. There is no check on c8, notice, because the bishop is covering that square. So the game might have continued with bishop takes f5, queen takes, rook c3 trying to cover the e3 square, but we just ignore that. So check, check, and mate. I mean, it's a very convincing win for black, and it kind of illustrates a lot of things that could go wrong with white's position. So what was the main mistake for white? Probably to allow the knight to come to d4 so easily and then underestimating the power of f5. That pawn's transformation can be okay for white, but not if the pawn is already on g4. So this is a memorable idea from black. So we have seen in the previous game, the standard kingside plan with f5, f4, g6, g5, g4, and then a kingside attack. Here in this game, we saw what happens if black plays g5, g4 earlier, and then breaks with f5. Overall, both games are very instructive in showing the power of black's position.